it's so painterly that I feel like I'm, you know, drawing and mark making. That's sort of one of the qualities I really love about it. It's kind of impressionistic and abstract, you know, and you just have to kind of stick with things and persevere and make lots of mistakes until perhaps you find your own voice through an image or style. That was Karen Waller, someone who's certainly found her own voice in photography, producing one of the most creative and diverse portfolios I've seen in a long time, including incredible ICM photography, striking aerial photography, and emotive portrait photography. I'm delighted to introduce you to Karen on today's episode of the Viewfinders Photography Podcast. I'm your host, Graham Dargie, a professional photographer based in Aberdeen in Scotland, and my role here is to uncover the thoughts and experiences of some of the best photographers from all over the world with the goal of inspiring you to take the next bold steps on your photography journey. Well, how's things? For me, I've been putting together some new Viewfinders Live events for this autumn, and I was shooting some casting headshots the other day, which was fantastic. Full day, back-to-back sessions. Um, Whenever you shoot, there's a certain amount of back-end work that comes with that, and I've been fitting that in where I can because it's the school holidays here well underway with that Uh, so I was spending lots of time with my daughter last week doing swimming, playdates, skating, visiting the grandparents, all kinds of stuff and uh, this week she's been in like a multi-sports camp which she loves, lots of activities for her so just the usual family life and work balance going on here a funny thing happened the other day I was in a shop with my daughter and suddenly walking towards me was Sheila Ritchie, one of my old college lecturers from like 20 years ago. So I stopped her and said who I am and she remembered me and we had a really lovely catch up and I was able to tell her what I've been up to since I left college and just had the opportunity to tell her I remembered her fondly and that what she'd done for me back in the day had made a difference. So that was just really, really nice, so heartwarming, really made my day. Um, Another really nice thing that happened was uh, a listener called James Evans reached out to me on Instagram with just the kindest review. James said, Hi Graham, just wanted to reach out and say I've recently found the Viewfinders podcast and I absolutely love it. It's a daily listen for me at work, keeping me in touch with my photographic side and it's so nice to hear so many conversations with you and some of the best influential photographers out there. It's really inspiring me to try new things and branch out, so thank you for that. Well, who doesn't love a bit of positive feedback? So thanks for that, James. Really appreciate it. Um, If you'd like to connect with me, be like James. Find me on Instagram at Viewfinders Podcast and let me know if you have any feedback or suggestions for future guests. Um, Don't forget to subscribe or follow Viewfinders on your favorite podcast platform so you don't miss new episodes and catch up with some of the 40 plus previous episodes with amazing guests from around the photography world. Okay, my guest this week is Karen Waller, a photographer based in Adelaide, South Australia. It was Karen's ICM images of agave plants that first caught my eye, but digging into her portfolio, I found she's also a fantastic aerial photographer and an accomplished portrait photographer with an amazing and diverse portfolio. Karen's creative journey started in childhood when she was encouraged to draw and paint and she went on to gain a degree in visual arts. Although photography has become her chosen medium, her work is still informed by the painter within. Karen's courageous curiosity has shaped a photographer whose work is quite unique and our conversation covers how she discovered ICM photography, how she's been able to use photography to get through difficult times in life, how she approaches new portrait subjects in the supermarket, as well as the stories behind some of her most memorable photographs. I loved meeting Karen. I hope you do too. Here's my conversation with the amazing Karen Waller. Karen Waller, welcome to Viewfinders Podcast. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you, Graham? Yeah, good, thanks. So for people listening, I'm in Aberdeen in Scotland and you're in Adelaide in Australia. Yes. And we're we're 10,054 miles apart, so um, wow. <laughs> couldn't be much further really. But I'm really excited to talk to you today. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah, just the same, I think of you similar to Julia Reddle, who I spoke to recently. Just yep. fantastic, um, creative photographer, not seeming to not seeming to be bound by rules, but just doing your own thing and really smashing mm-hmm. it. So 
Oh, um, thank you. Uh, preparing for the chat today, it's sort of like I'm talking to three different photographers because <laughs> of the the kind of work that you do. So we'll we'll get into that uh, as we go. But well, you're in Adelaide. Did you grow up in Adelaide? So yeah, so I live in Adelaide, which is the capital of South Australia. Not a huge city, maybe you know less than one and a half million people. Um, so South Australia. I grew up in South Australia, but mostly in uh, small country towns in the state. My dad worked in a, a bank and we moved around a lot. So uh, mm. rural um, country upbringing and, yeah, moved to Adelaide once I finished school. Um, yeah, a country background, basically. But, yeah. And so I read on your website that um, you were always encouraged to pursue drawing and painting. And, yes. And, and so was that sort of your main pastime? With if I get maybe were you moving around? Was it just maybe you didn't have solid friendships all the way through? Would that um, lead you to be more creative? Um, maybe I'm filling in gaps there, but well, I definitely was very supported supported by my parents or by my mum in particular to you know pursue that creative thing, which was painting and drawing. Um, yeah, definitely. There was that sort of that friendship issue where we, we I basically went to seven different primary schools mm -hmm. in my in growing up. So, you know, one year in each town and quite different towns as well. And each 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 place that we lived in, it has very distinct memories for me, um, probably because it was so short. Um, I don't know. I think I just was just a very creative person. And the fact that I was encouraged to do that really, it gave me sort of confidence to continue doing that. And I felt that that was sort of my path and my direction, mm -hmm. you know, from quite a young age. Mm -hmm. And I was, I mean, I guess I had that natural drawing ability and, mm -hmm. you know, people could see that, could see that in me. So... So was your mum a creative person as well then? Yes, she's very creative. She did, I mean, in other ways, perhaps sort of more through perhaps gardening and she does like furniture restoration. I mean, she back in the 70s, she did like a lot of pottery and um, ceramic type stuff. So yes, very creative. But perhaps for her, that was never really, when she was growing up, that side of her was never really encouraged or supported. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but she's very much all my whole life. I mean, she still very much um, encourages and supports me in that creative mm. process. Yeah, so that's kind of, that's really nice. It's good to have that, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, definitely. When you're feeling like you're struggling or haven't got that sort of motivation or um, confidence, there's people in the background going, yeah, you know, you can do this and, mm -hmm. yeah. So. Yeah. And then, so you went on to study a degree in visual arts. Yes, yeah, so I studied painting and drawing at, and did a degree. And so, yeah, I guess I, I, I wanted to be a painter at the time, but it, I, I struggled in terms of how to market my work. And um, I guess back when I did my degree, it was it was such a different world, and I think we didn't actually learn about marketing and <laughs> how to promote yourself as an artist back at that time. And it's probably quite different now, though. But so it's just like you paint, you learn to paint, you draw, and then you go out into the world and somehow you know survive as an artist. So. Yeah. I kind of I struggled with that but um okay so did you go into some other kind of work then for a career yeah yeah I just sort of I did other work yeah I did and sort of continued with the creative stuff on the side or you know alongside of the other work yeah mm -hmm. and so when did photography come into the scene yeah so kind of in the mid 90s I, I had access to a Polaroid camera I had studied, I had I had um, done a bit of study at uni, like in the dark room, so I had that experience of um, photography in the dark room and printing and, and stuff, but it was kind of in the mid-90s I had access to a Polaroid camera and I just was 
drawn into that instant gratification Mm -hmm. of just being able to (laughs) it sounds really strange now doesn't it because so much of what we have is instant but Mm -hmm. i just was drawn to that and also the ability to manipulate the images just as they were processing you know you could draw on them and just push the ink around in the within the frame and i just i really really love doing that and i did a lot of images i took a lot of images with the polaroid camera but yeah but then i started to i guess want i just wanted more control over the images and then so i sort of moved into you know I bought an slr camera and just started learning about controlling the image process yeah Mm -hmm. and so when you got your slr camera that was still in the film kind of days yes it was yep yeah okay and then Mm -hmm. in the dark room as well uh initially no um probably in the early 2000s we set up a dark room in our house here and 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 i was doing some study and doing a lot of processing in the dark room Mm-hmm. So yeah, so I did a lot of um, printing in the dark room prior to moving into digital. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one thing I wanted to pop back to then was you said about the photography with the Polaroid being like an instant yeah. presentation. I'm yeah. I'm only a photographer. I don't. I'm not like I, I do some coloring in like when my daughter's coloring in books, but I, I don't. <laughs> I know what that process. Where's the gratification? as a drawer or an artist, a drawer is not a word, is it? Is the gratification in the making or in, in the having made? And is that, I mean, is that, do you see it as a distinctly different thing in terms of getting that feeling of having of having done it? I think it's just, yeah, having that, having that vision or that idea, that concept, and then seeing it immediately on the image. I mean, it, sound, it does sound strange because that's what we live with now, mm-hmm. but I guess, I just loved that at the time and you know I wanted more of that I wanted instant gratification because we weren't we didn't have that with film you know we had to wait and I guess that's a beautiful thing too the delayed gratification and having to wait but um of course now you know in we we see everything immediately so but but there was just that thing of just having something in my hand that was that I just that I'd visualized or um had an idea around and then i was holding that in my hand and 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 it's a little beautiful little object as well yeah yeah the polaroid yeah so that was i mean i guess that that was just the thing that started me in that that was the the moment where i really started to become interested in photography as my chosen medium as Mm -hmm. opposed to painting and drawing Mm -hmm. um but everything I do is very much influenced by the painter that I was and, you know, that person that studied drawing and painting mm-hmm. because, you know, you're visualising an image as a two-dimensional thing. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, so those that study that I did really helps me to understand how space works and that really helps with my editing of my imagery, yeah. Okay, so now you're into photography on your timeline here. Yes. The way I know you is for your ICM, the kind of low-key yeah. ICM pictures, which we'll talk about in a minute. Before you came to that, were you doing more like traditional landscape photos or what kind of photography were you into at the time? I guess the ICMs has really, that that came about due to lock, COVID lockdown. Okay. And not being able to go out and I was thinking what, you know, I just wanted to be able to do something creative while I was limited in where I could go and what I could do. So that's, that's where that started for mm. me. Prior to that, probably about six years ago, I, my father passed away and I was really, really struggling after, after he died. And I found that going into the landscape with my camera that was a place where I could really just get lost and all of the noise and constant (laughs) chatter in my head would just be silenced and Mm. I could just you know that mindfulness that practice of mindfulness and just getting lost in and being in the moment so that's kind of where the landscape photography began for me 
Okay, okay, I understand. Yeah, as a way of kind of getting through that grief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can understand yeah. about if having just a busy mind and then something like it could be music or it could be photography or whatever yeah. it could be that can just take you away from that. Yeah, so so definitely that um, the creative process is real really helps my with the you know sort of mental health stuff as well. It's kind of really really an important part of mm -hmm. how I need to function, I guess. I I wonder if you I know you've sort of discovered maybe the strength or power of that through losing your dad yeah but i wonder yeah. if now looking back you could realize if that had always been a part of just dealing with life or just doing life um because i think the the making that you do with with your drawing and painting that's a mindful kind of thing as well and then photography yeah. i'm thinking about film photography and where you have to really be in it because you can't see the the result immediately. And then the dark yeah. room side of that is very mindful, very makey. Um, yeah, so yeah. maybe it's something that's always just been a part of your life anyway. I guess. Yeah, I, I yeah I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, and I I would I agree. I guess I probably I probably recognised it at that moment and could see really how beneficial it could be in yeah. sort of moving forward with things that I was struggling with. But yeah, I guess it's, it is, has always been an important part of how I deal with life and how mm -hmm. I live my life. And yeah, very yeah. much so. And then I guess when things got difficult, you maybe you just knew how to do it. You knew how to, how to get to that place of dealing with it. Yes, yes, yes. And the other thing for me growing up, in sort of those country areas was that sort of connection with the environment and nature and mm -hmm. and I guess my appreciation for nature very much came from my my dad and even his mum and through my mum as well so I can certainly say that that has very much informed how I see the world and my appreciation of nature and the landscape and mm -hmm. and the environment and wildlife as well. So mm -hmm. it's so uh, powerful. The obvious. I mean, it's obvious to say it out loud, but when you think about it, the influence that parents have on you is is just so I don't know, far-reaching and deep. Yes. Yep. I, I've seen on your Instagram at least that you have one daughter. I don't know your yes. setup, but do you connect with nature with her as well? Is that something you've continued? Yes, definitely. Yeah, she's she's in her last year of school now, so she's seventeen. That was a very important part of her um, upbringing, and you know, she really had, she had that kind of love of nature and animals, and has a very good knowledge of birds. Whereas a lot of people don't, they don't know the names of birds, but yeah, she, she has a very good knowledge and she's very creative. And I guess we've always encouraged that and supported it. She's, um, perhaps she has different ways of expressing her creativity though. So yeah, it's good to kind of see that developing in different ways. Yeah. <laughs> To jump into your photography then the, the images that brought you to me or me to you whichever way were that these icm pictures they're low-key kind of icm abstract pictures of plants i think yeah. i'm going to get you yeah. to talk about them and describe them but they're so creative i mean i've never seen anything like that which is so rare well wow. you know what i mean i think it's so rare nowadays well, that's really yeah, nice to see a, a, a type of, of photography that is just really fresh and new and creative so um yeah I was going to ask how you got into that but you were saying lockdown so can you talk a bit more about that process of of finding that photography style and maybe describe the picture as well for people who might be listening in the car can't see the image yeah okay so I mean we were quite lucky here in South Australia we didn't really have protracted lockdowns I think it was sort of about four weeks or six weeks and that you know that was the longest period it was maybe a few weekends here and there but you know I, I, I really needed to still continue to be creative and mm -hmm. use my camera in some way just within and find things within my yard and um, I've got a bit of a 
a, a, an area of agave plants and so that was when I began experimenting with the ICM or intentional camera movement. Mm -hmm. um, so using a slow shutter speed and, you know, moving the camera during that, that exposure to create kind of blurry images. Um, well, they're sort of blurry, but they kind of, but you can still capture definition as well. Um, so the agave plant was a great subject and I can I still go back to that one subject because it seems to work so well for the kind of images that I'm creating because it's quite simple. It's got that sort of fluidity mm. to it and it's got the lovely sort of light edges that capture seem to capture very well um, in using that technique. So, you know, some of the images are quite simple in that I've just captured a, a single um, a single agave plant. And, I, you know, I've kind of developed just with that technique, I've de developed some quite nice editing techniques to really bring out, um, you know, the, the highlights and mm -hmm. in the images. So, you know, I've, I've feel like I've mastered something that works very well for those particular images. So, so you know, I've got those single black and, and they're all in black and white as well, so monochromatic. Um, and, you know, quite simple. I'm just aiming for sometimes just that simplicity. And some of the other images, I've just taken a single leaf um, from the ICM Im images and created more of an illustrative image where I've just overlaid um, one single portion and overlaid it to create a new image. Okay. Um, so more complicated. So mm -hmm. you would know what which images I'm referring to, Graham. Yeah, I think I do. I just from seeing you describe that, yeah, I can I think I can see that. But there's obviously there are a yeah. couple of different kind of ways that you do it. Yeah, yeah, and again, you know, look, I'm, I'm, I think, I think what you meant, you mentioned earlier about taking risks and breaking rules, and I, I think that's been a lovely process because it has given me that, you know, because there's so many rejects, there's so many failures, mm -hmm. and, but sometimes I get one, and I do love, I love that process of, I think it's so important to take risks and to fail. And I need to be, or I need to be reminded of that at times as well. That it's okay to make those mistakes, and that's how we learn. And that, I mean, that was the, that's been that process of developing that those particular images, you know, by trial and error and making lots of mistakes. So yeah, but yeah. ultimately, I think I've, yeah, I've got some quite nice, <laughs> some nice images there, and I'll keep creating them and capturing them. So I think I'm just clicking through your Instagram as you're talking and. Um, yeah. A lot of my favorite photographers are people who have been guests uh, on the podcast. I've noticed are, are liking your photographs, so I think yeah. they've, they've been really well yeah. received um, by people who know what they're what they're doing. I guess. Yeah, I think yeah, I've had really great feedback, and yeah, they seem to be people really seem to enjoy them. And um, I mean, it's kind of it, I'm quite surprised that I can I can have a bit of a break, but then I'll go back and have an, another revisit and think, yeah, I really. I really love doing these and mm -hmm. I, I'm still finding new things. And, yeah, I haven't found another ICM subject that I love as much as that. Just yeah. that one plant. It's, it's well, it's, yeah, that's a niche, so it's okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, are you able to pre-visualise in any way or do you just get the camera and, and play? I think I do a bit of both. I, I guess I've taken so many images using that technique with that one subject that I do, I can sort of pre-visualise a bit more now. And I, I do have a very specific technique and I use kind of a particular like shutter speed of probably around one eighth of a second, maybe a little bit slower. Just, you know, it seems to work at a particular mm -hmm. speed particularly well. Um, too long and you lose that definition. Sometimes one second might be too long. Mm -hmm. and um, you can lose, yeah, that sort of wonderful detail and layering that I've kind of managed to master. So, yeah, there's things that I guess I've learned a lot 
just um, through trial and error. And yeah, I think I can definitely pre visualize and know how to achieve. Yeah, I know how to achieve the um, look sometimes that I'm wanting. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like you just developed the whole technique yourself, or did you have any ICM sort of mentors or heroes? No. <laughs> No, I didn't. No, no, I didn't yourself. have any mentors or heroes. I just, I mean, I didn't really know anything about it. I just, I guess I've always sort of loved long exposures and had, you know, I've been doing sort of landscape photography and, you know, it long exposures and probably experimenting a little bit with kind of long exposures and panning. Mm-hmm. But I think I think the other thing is that I really love is that it's it's so painterly mm-hmm. that that kind of takes me back to being a painter and I think that's one of the things that I really love about it. I feel like I'm, you know, drawing and mark making. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. the that, that's sort of one of the qualities I really love about it. It's kind of impressionistic and abstract and yeah. 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 It's it's really encouraging actually hearing that you just you've just created the whole thing. I mean, it's so encouraging and inspiring because I think it gives people permission to to play and experiment and try their own things. Because obviously, we see you know images we like and we want to maybe try what someone else is yeah. trying. But and that's fine. That's what we all do. But to hear that you can actually just do your own thing. Um, yeah. and that can work out to be really successful. That That's really good. I think it is, it's so easy to imitate other people and so easy to want to imitate other people. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, I really, I guess I really attempt to try not to do that, but try to find my own way of doing things or my own way of telling stories. So... Yeah, I mean, it's it's nice to know that you think that's encouraging. Um, yeah, and and it's good for other people to think that they, you know, and you just have to kind of stick with things and persevere and make lots of mistakes until mm-hmm. perhaps you find your own voice through your through an image or style. I suppose for you, you've been creative. You've been drawing your whole life. Mm-hmm. I would just wonder if that that depth of experience of having just done and tried and sketched and scribbled and improved, yeah. I'm sure you must have improved a lot with the drawing over the years and painting, just having that understanding of, okay, yeah. experimenting and, and making mistakes and failing is, is part of the process. It's not an end of the process. That must yeah. have stood you in good stead as a photographer. I think it really does definitely helps with my editing and using like a Wacom tablet and a pen, Mm -hmm. you know, I can get that. It it is like drawing. Um, So, you know, that's, it's much more kind of tactile and, and organic, I guess. So, yeah, I feel, look, I don't, it feels very much like I'm that same person that painted and, and did drawings but i'm just using you know photography and digital photography to create yeah just using different tools different tools i wanted to talk about your aerial photography because um yeah i i knew about your icm and when i went to your feed uh i was you know your aerial photography is so cool it's with that kind of images you don't really know if it's a close up of some fungus or what it is in a, in a good way it makes you stop and look and think about it um and so yeah i wondered how that came on your radar when did you first get into aerial photography yeah so i was in a um, professional organization have been for a number of years for about 12 years called the Australian Institute of Professional Photographers. However, unfortunately, it sort of came to an end last year and the organisation organization closed down. But we had state uh, state awards, state competitions for photog- professional photographers and then national um, awards for professional photographers. So I think, you know, I developed a lot through that process um with my work and being judged and 
but it, but I also got to know a lot of photographers work and a lot of aerial photographers whose work I really admired and I just again I just was very much drawn to that abstract painterly kind of way that can be seen in aerial photography mm -hmm. So again, sort of taking me back to that painter in me. Um, I did a couple of flights last year. One was over um, Wyala, which is north in South Australia at the top of the Gulf. And so I did some flights over there. There's some salt works and just, just along the coast there. Mm -hmm. And then I did another flight over York Peninsula and the Salt Lakes. And there's a lot of salt lakes. If you go to Google Earth and you go to York Peninsula mm -hmm. um, near Yorktown, you can see they're just there everywhere. It's quite amazing. So I did a flight over there and I did get some quite nice aerial. So that, that was my first sort of experience. But I didn't really love the flying thing. I didn't, you know, it's not a bit, bit, bit scared, a bit scared mm -hmm. and in the very small plane. So I, I decided that I would get a drone that would just give me a bit more flexibility, which I, I think I bought the drone in about September last year. Okay. And so, look, you, you, so that's basically my, you know, that's the work, that, that's the imagery I've been creating recently because mm -hmm. it's kind of a bit of a new toy, a new thing. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's so different than the other work that we've been talking about. It couldn't be more different. Yeah, I know, um, it's sort of, it's weird, isn't it, that I kind of do these different things, but at the core of, what I'm doing, there's something that still takes me back to this painterly thing mm -hmm. or this painter in mm -hmm. me. And that's kind of actually nice to acknowledge that, that I guess that's still who I am. Yeah. Um, even though I'm different, working in different genres. So. But do your photographs look like your paintings? I think some of them do. Definitely some of the... Um, some of the Salt Lake aerials do remind me of some of the paintings that I was doing mm -hmm. way back when I was even in my sort of art school days. So, yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. So, you know, I thought having a drone would give me a lot of flexibility and I'd be able to just fly it anywhere, but it's, it's not that simple. You, you've got, there's a lot of rules around where you can fly, obviously, um, national parks and conservation parks. So that, the reason I kept going back to York Peninsula, which is sort of where I grew up, I started high school in a town called Minleton, and my mum's still there. So I go back there quite often, but I have access to these salt lakes and, and they're all quite close together, um, you know, just in a small uh, half an hour drive, yeah, to and from the various lakes. Mm -hmm. You know, so basically around, you know, and getting permission to access some of those lakes is reasonably straightforward. Okay. So, you know, the, the, there's a lot of things to consider with the drone photography and the, the, the privacy and getting permission has been, I guess that's one of the challenges that I didn't really expect. But, mm -hmm. yeah, so with the Salt Lakes, it's relatively straightforward and I know that I can fly in some of these areas. Mm -hmm. and I keep going back for that reason and I keep going back because they're different all the time okay because of the salt lake I guess the the, the land the terrain is very colorful um, yes you have these remains of old sort of dead trees it looks like which sort of uh, in, interrupt the images and just a lot of a, a flowing movement kind of feel yeah. to the to the yeah. So again, yeah. I was wondering if you're able to visualize any of that before, or you just have to put the thing up and see what you see. Yeah, I mean, I guess I know I'm familiar with some of those locations, so I know. So there's one lake called Lake Fowler. Uh, that lake was mined for salt. It's no longer mined, but they set up all these um, berms, which are kind of little raised areas and and little places where the water would flow through i think i don't really understand the process but a lot of the images you'll kind of see this flowing kind of salty water or may just be dried salt mm -hmm. and yeah so the berms are really fantastic so so lake fowl is really quite amazing for those flowing lines mm -hmm. and um some quite beautiful colors as well um 
some of the other lakes, you know, you get a lot of the pink, pink salty uh, or, or pink water, and that's due to a particular type of algae which grows in the salt lakes, creating that pink okay. colouring. And so as that dries out, actually, I like the salt lakes when the water recedes because it just leaves some beautiful patterns behind. Um, yeah, and, you know, some of the salt encrusted trees so yeah, the, it really they, these places just really lend themselves to um, just abstract landscape imagery, and you know I love that. I, I I kind of find I did photograph them just from a just from ground level. I have done a lot over the years, but I feel that what I'm capturing now really is much more satisfying mm -hmm. in terms of how I'm portraying these places. Yeah, it's really amazing. I spoke to um, a guy called George Steinmetz not long ago, who's a National Geographic guy, and he's an aerial photographer, has been oh, for yeah, many yeah. years. Yeah. And he, a lot of his work, he does use a drone now, but he's used um motorized paraglider so he just goes up you know, oh, okay in a wow yeah. yeah yeah it's amazing and <laughs> that's, you, I don't yeah know that's that's amazing yeah so i don't know if you're aware of george but you would check out his work it's insanely amazing okay um, yeah, you would I, I think you would like it so and it's been the most popular episode by oh, far wow. he's a really popular uh, photographer okay so i just i read somewhere it must be on your website my intention with the drone images would be to consider the landscape and the human impact on that particular place. So to me, I'm just looking at it aesthetically going, well, that looks nice. But for you, yeah. you have a deeper um, level, a deeper way to look at that. I think, you know, a lot of the images that do perhaps show the human impact, they're qu it's quite subtle, I think, you know, and you might, it's not necessarily really overt it might just be, you know, a fence or some some of the images have tyres that have been dumped and maybe just sort of fallen trees or dead trees that are in that landscape. So, you know, I'm interested in that idea. Um, but, yeah, I think if, I, if it is included, I think it's quite subtle and I think often you just have to kind of think about it or it's sort of part of the story that you might need to kind of seek out by looking sort of deeper within the image. The other part of your work I, I wanted to ask you about was your portraits. Um, I think it's unusual for someone to be good at nature photography and good at portraits. And I, it seems like obviously the natural world is a big thing for you or a big source of inspiration mm. so I was wondering how you got into photographing people I think I was very I've been interested in portrait photography and I think that was my main thrust for a number of years and I was okay. you know a lot of my work was around sort of portrait photography you know family portraits weddings and stuff but but then my own personal work and look I still you know that's very much something that I love to do but I think there's just this year, the COVID has impacted on that, especially here in South Australia, because we were relatively, didn't have COVID. And then, you know, the state borders opened and it has impacted. And because a lot of my subjects have been, I love photographing older people. So, you know, that's sort of been a bit more challenging because I've kind of needed to consider COVID in the equation. Um, look, I love photographing people and trying to tell their story. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in capturing sort of, you know, that juxtapos juxtaposition between, you know, the lightness, the darkness, opposing themes, so vulnerability and strength. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, look, if you definitely go down, you probably portraits on my on my website you can see, and also lots if you scroll down my Instagram page, there's. You know, I do have a lot of portrait work there. So, yeah, I think, yeah, I love I love portrait photography and that, that challenge of trying to tell the story of of someone. And, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're very good at that, I would say. Oh, um, thank it's you. It's 
like to me when I take a portrait, it's just a picture of the person. <laughs> but you're yeah. one, you you yeah. really have that storytelling element, and it. it's very very good. And I different styles as well. You're not like placing one style on everybody. Obviously, you're treating every situation uniquely, and that that must be part of your storytelling approach as well. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, some people say that they can tell my work, my portraits. They they recognise it. I don't know. I guess yeah, it is. I do try and tell this. Try and try and find different ways to tell the story, depending on you know what the story is and how that may be best communicated. And so, in in terms of telling someone's story, would you uh, would you approach someone that you to photograph that you know has a an interesting story, or how do you get into that? And how how much of a part of the session is that? Yeah, interacting with the subject yeah. and and getting the story from them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's very important. The interaction and spending time hearing their story, getting to know the person. Yep, that's a very, very important part of the process. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of my subjects, York Peninsula, some of the people have, you know, I might say to my mum and or her partner, you know, who do you know anyone? Who who do you know that would be really interesting? And they'll kind of come up with some people, potential subjects. So that's been really, really helpful just talking to them or sometimes I might see someone in the supermarket and approach them be really brave and say you know look I think I really want to hear your story you look I think you'd make an amazing Mm -hmm. subject and really flatter them and Mm -hmm. (laughs) and that's really bold I think we could all we could all see someone in the supermarket and think that but (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to to actually go and and approach them, so how do you, how does that go down? Do you have is that a good approach for you? Does it work out? It has worked out. It has worked out, and yeah, I think sometimes you just look. I mean, I can be really brave, but I can also be really scared, mm-hmm. and so it doesn't always. I may not always find that bravery, but if I think it's worth doing, if I I, I can, you know, I can really. I'll do it if I think it's worthwhile. Yeah, look, I've never had anyone be really <laughs> unkind to me. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, you just, I think it's just that thing of always, always looking. And I think that's probably what I do. I'm constantly looking and whether that's for potential portrait subjects or, you know, at nature, but it, you never stop seeing, you never stop visualising the world in terms of creating an image. Um, it, it just never stops. So, uh, yeah, I'm always looking out for, for potential portrait subjects, definitely. Yeah, and the, the other thing I was going to say about your portraits, uh, people are very present in the pictures, you know, they're, mm-hmm. they're right mm-hmm. there. So how do you achieve that? Is it in, is it in your interactions? Well, yeah, I guess it must be in my interactions and just really listening to their story and asking them questions that, well, probably even asking them difficult questions mm-hmm. and really connecting, just finding that sort of deep connection. And then sometimes that, that moment comes, you look back through your photos and then you see something in one of those images that really that you really connect with and that really perhaps tells the story of that person. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's it's not, it's very it's not easy it's not easy to get that connection and you know of course I have a lot of images that get get rejected everyone does but it's just finding that one that one moment that is something Mm -hmm. that tells the viewer something about that person Mm -hmm. Um, look I had there's an image that I captured I think, oh, look, it's, it's the, the the subject, his name's Scott, and he's a, he was a farmer on York Peninsula. Mm-hmm. And and I, I was, it was suggested that I take his portrait, but I, I didn't think he would allow me to do so. And I was really just absolutely so happy when he, he agreed to do it. And... Um, I think, yeah, it was really a great, interesting session, really interesting person. And unfortunately, he passed away probably 
you know, like within a year of me capturing the portrait. So I sort of, I kind of had this feeling maybe he agreed to do it because he knew mm. that it was something that he could give to his family. Um, mm. And I think he knew that he was actually, I think he knew that, I think he knew he was, wasn't was well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was really quite difficult, um, that loss and knowing that he'd sort of passed away after, because I kept thinking, I want to go back and do more. I want to, you know, that was so great. I want to go back and revisit this mm -hmm. fantastic subject and find out more about him, hear, hear more about his story. So, yeah, I was, I'm glad you brought that up because, it's one of the pictures I'd looked out to to maybe ask you about. So, yeah, um, this guy, it's a older guy, kind of got grey hair, lots of character on his face, lots. yeah, lots of character, <laughs> and, lots of character, yeah, amazing and beard. Just, a, he just looks amazing. I mean, it, it's, yeah, he's yeah, he's he's just amazing, phenomenal. very very intelligent, but a very solitary sort of person as well. You know. Mm -hmm. um, so quite a very interesting yeah. person. Farmers here, I guess, they're out in, in all weathers. Yes. Uh, in the cold and, and we think of as the cold and, and the rain and the rain and the wind. It's, I guess down there it's just hot. Is it just hot all the time? Well, in summer, yeah, we can, you know, we can have temperatures up to sort of 40 plus degrees. Um Winter, like today, I think it's been sort of around 12 degrees, so a bit colder. You know, that's kind of winter cold. That's a cold day here okay. in South Australia. But, yeah, you know, we get high 30s, high yeah. 30 degrees in summer. So, yeah, he's got that very leather, leathery, yeah. you know, being out in the sun kind mm -hmm. of character to his face. So, yeah. yeah. But then you, you do see these pictures of, you know, bearded guys with, you know, character. But I, it's rare to get one that's as, as engaged as your picture of Scott here. Um, mm, he's really with mm. you. You know, there's the, the one on your website where it's, it's black in the background and he's just looking sort of slightly side on at you. Oh, yes. I mean, it's, yeah. and then and there must, there's a companion one I've looked at. Maybe it's from yes. the Instagram where he's looking away. Maybe they were taken in the same spot. Yeah, but same. Yeah. They're, they're both yep, great. Yep. But that engagement just is so strong and there's so much. And, on his face, do you know what I mean? In his eyes. Yeah, yeah, and I think there's. I think the thing I love about that photo is that there is that um, that strength. That you know, he's this just that rough exterior, but there's that vulnerability. You know, he's just sort of exposed himself to me mm -hmm. in that moment. And you know, what more can you ask for in a portrait yeah. to have your subject? just reveal so much to you as the capture of that portrait yeah yeah and i think yeah. if that those moments of vulnerability they can be very fleeting and you, yes I'm, i've had one one particular two yeah. like two times that i've really really got it with somebody and um i almost feel bad for take for pressing the button you know because they're so open do you know what i mean yeah um, but yeah it's what we're there for i guess and um Another one I wanted to pick up on you, just on that theme of strength, totally different subject, but you have um, Mursi Woman and Omo Valley. There's a, a few subjects oh, yeah. from, from there. So the one that I'm looking at is she's faced square onto the camera, shoulders straight towards the camera, and um, just a strong subject, you know, portrayed mm. in all her strength. And yeah, dignity yeah. and beauty, just amazing mm, with this strong black mm, background. Mm. Can you talk about that experience as well? Yes. So at the beginning of 2000, and well, I get my years mixed up. I think it was the beginning of 2020. So the big, for, I land, I arrived, um, tra traveling to Ethiopia. You know, it's been something I've wanted to do for a long time due to some connections in the past with the Ethiopian community in South Australia in Adelaide. Right. You know, so I was able to travel to Ethiopia and I arrived on January the 1st, 2020. So that was kind of a big, significant thing, you know, a dream. And, you know, I was feeling pretty brave to do this. Mm -hmm. And I travelled with another photographer from 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 Australia who, who does tours in Ethiopia and Africa. And so we, and we had a driver and a 
Cook traveling. So there were just the four of us driving. So we drove to the Omo Valley in um, southern Ethiopia and we traveled around to different different um, cultural groups in that region and, and photograph. So my, my objective was to photograph the people in the Omo Valley. Uh, so I was just there for a couple of weeks and yeah, so it was amazing. It was just absolutely amazing. Just, just I can't, it's hard to kind of talk about and think that I, I actually did that and that I was there in that place. So how do you build that connection? Because this lady that I'm talking about, she's yeah. she's there. She is 100% there. Mm. I, if you do see pictures taken on these kind of trips where they're just pictures of people, again, you, you've really engaged this lady and you're showing her looking so strong. And, and I, I mm. really love that. How do you do that across cultural and presumably language barriers? Yeah, that's, yeah, very, very challenging, very challenging to do that. I mean, you've got someone, the, uh, the, the guide with us, the Ethiopian guide, sort of able to help communicate. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I did find that, that very difficult, that language barrier. So if I did get those images, you know, it, it's wonderful to know that that, that did happen because... I struggled, yeah, I really struggled with that. And, mm. you know, I'd, I'd love to go back and do it again and have another opportunity to to, to capture more of those portraits. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's all, I guess, the other thing, just that, that capturing portraits in those villages, it's all very transactional. So, you know, you kind of have limited time mm-hmm. um, to do that. So... Yeah, you just do your best and try and communicate as best as you can um, mm. through gestures and um, using your guide to help perhaps mm. pose people. So yeah, well, it's this worked out well. It's, so I, 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 so I hope people can go check out your website then and and your feed because there's so many and and such varied subject matter on there, and it's all really really good. So a few things we haven't touched on as well, but. Yeah, thanks for seeing that. Usually we do a round called Double Exposure where I ask you about a picture and then I ask you to tell me about a picture. But I think we've covered that in just in this part yeah. of the chat because some amazing experiences and really an insight into how and why you do it. So thanks so much. Let's quickly touch on camera gear. Yeah. So what are you using? So what's your favourite sort of combination? So I'm... Um... I, when I went to Ethiopia, I bought a Nikon Z7, okay, mainly right. because, yeah, so the mirrorless, yeah, it's uh, great for travelling. And my favourite lenses are uh, 24 to 70, 50 mil, 105. I guess they're the main three that okay. I sort of use. And so do you use the, the Z-specific uh, lenses or do you use the the sort of DSLR lenses with the adapter? Yeah, I use the adapter just because okay. I had those lenses. Yeah, mm-hmm. so that's basically what I shoot with. So Okay, and then you're when you're up in the sky, are you what kind of... Um, so drone? I've got a Mavic Pro 2, um, so that's got like a Hasselblad camera in that. Um, but it's not a huge, it's like a, um, megapixel-wise, it's not... Well, it's like about 24, I think. I don't have as much flexibility in my editing with those images mm-hmm. as I do with the Z7, but, you know, it's... Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, 24, it's good. Okay. Yeah, it's good. And then it's come up a few times, but I guess processing is a big part of your workflow. Yes, yes. So what would you like to know? Um, <laughs> I presume you're using Lightroom and Photoshop? Or yeah, like, different? yeah, Lightroom, Photoshop, yep. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. so just the yeah, usual like, stuff. So, the usual stuff. Yeah, global adjustments in Lightroom, and you know, a lot of detailed editing in um, in Photoshop with some good sort of techniques for my black and white images that I've really feel quite good about. Some things that I've sort of developed that really help. You know, kind of almost like dodging burning in the dark room, but mm. sort of some other other methods camera equipment you know it's 
I don't get obsessed about that stuff. I just make the most of what I have. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I've got a couple of good lenses that that work well for me. And all of my work basically is using those three lenses, I guess. Cool. Okay. All right. Um, that takes us to the final round, which is called Motor Drive because it's quick fire. So here are some quick fire <laughs> questions if you're ready, Karen. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wide angle or telephoto? Uh, wide angle. <laughs> okay. That's all right. Um, coffee or tea? A coffee. Stay up late or wake up early? Wake up early. This is the big one. Expensive lens cloths. I'm starting again. Expensive what, lens cloth <laughs> or the corner of your shirt. Oh, sorry. Oh, corner of my shirt. Yeah. Okay, a proper pro. Um, what's your <laughs> go-to emoji? Um, that little, little caring heart one. <laughs> okay, a caring heart. That's yeah, all right. Yeah. I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, 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 that. Yeah. That definitely matches <laughs> what I know about you. So that that works. Thank you. Okay, things to do in Adelaide. Okay, what would you do? Things to Central do. Market, Botanic Garden. Oh yeah, like a wine tour. Yeah. What's good to do there? Oh yeah. Oh, wine, definitely wine tour, Barossa Valley, McLaren Vale. Um, We have fantastic festivals in South Australia, the Fringe Festival, the Adelaide Festival of Art, um, that beginning of the year, they're fantastic. Guam Adelaide, um, beginning of the year when it's summer, uh, lots of amazing beaches. We've got the Flinders Ranges, lots of fantastic salt lakes to photograph. Um, lots of pubs, great restaurants. Um, okay. <laughs> oh, is that, does that, that yeah. sort of covers a lot of the things I like to do. Is that the winey kind of part of uh, Australia or? There's a few winey parts, but we've got some fantastic wine parts. Yeah, Barossa Valley and McLaren Vale. So, you know, it's close to where I live. So it's just a 40 minute drive to go and drink some amazing wine and eat amazing food. So, yeah, mm-hmm. it's a good, great place to live. Yes. You should come to South Australia. Have you been to, have you been to Australia before? No, I haven't. I was, when I was like, um, I don't know, 19 or 20, I was thinking about doing the backpacking thing and then I just, oh, yeah. but I, I never thought about it till I was looking at the map yesterday, research, like preparing yeah, for yeah. this chat. Just when I saw the map, it really threw me back to that time of, thinking about oh. doing that and I thought well how my life would be different if I had you know yeah um, oh oh well there's still time to come back and visit we'll get there for sure okay anyway so <laughs> back to the uh, quick fire what's a weird thing I can find in your camera bag oh uh, a screwdriver okay a screwdriver that's not probably that weird but it's a little weird that's I just mean... be- it, is it yeah oh good good it, <laughs> just because it, it's just my tripod the mount on my camera it's yeah i've got to tighten it yeah last last one when do you feel at peace with the universe oh when i'm out in the environment when i'm out in the landscape shooting just with my camera on my own and when it's when the weather's wild i love that Mm -hmm. i love that those wintry which probably don't really compare to what you get but yeah, twelve degrees is not wintry here, but I, I, know. <laughs> I, know, I know that I know, but that's been, yeah, no. What what's the coldest your? Uh, in winter, it'd be minus five, minus eight, something like yeah, that. Would be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Like regularly, yeah. It would be around zero. Um, I want to thank you, Karen. This has been so interesting to me. I, I'm really. I, I just love your work and I'm really glad to have had this chance to talk with you around the world. It's amazing. So I hope people can go check you out and um, yeah, all the best. Keep up the good oh, work. Thank doing, you. Doing yeah, great. much appreciated. Thanks for your time, Graham. Thanks for listening. Follow Karen on Instagram. Links to everything we spoke about are in the show notes. And if you enjoyed this episode, check out my conversations with Julia Reddell and Father Bailey. That's all for now. Take care, enjoy your photography, and I'll see you out there.